Good morning and welcome to worship at Lionel Lakes Community Church. We are glad you're here. Uh, one quick announcement. This is my second to the last sermon uh, at Lionel Lakes Community Church. After October 2nd, I will be stepping away as pastor from this congregation. But again, thank you for joining us and we're so glad you're here. My wife Amy says that I'm the only one that feels this way, but I just know that that's not true. Taking care of other people's responsibilities is annoying, right? Like taking care of somebody else's dog is just a huge burden. You know, dogs stink. They're, they're messy creatures. They roll around in dirt, mud, and other things. They lick stuff, they chew stuff, and they have all sorts of weird bodily functions. And all of those things feel fine when it's your dog. You know, it feels appropriate. Like, I took on this responsibility to care for this animal and help it have a good life full of love, joy, and cheese. But then when it's someone else's dog, there's like a flip in the switch. Like, this isn't my responsibility. That's their responsibility. They chose this. They wanted a dog. They wanted to care for it. They have to feed it, walk it, and all that other stuff. Why should I have to take care of somebody else's mess? And I only know about this feeling with pets, but I'm sure it's similar with kids, right, parents? So, you know, it seems good and right to take care of your own child and make sure they have what they need to to thrive and succeed. But, but then when you are suddenly watching someone else's kids and they don't have the same manners that your child does, you might think, why do I have to teach this kid the importance of washing their hands before eating? That's not my job. And so when I find myself in this situation, I usually end up doing the bare minimum. You know, I feed the pet, I water the pet, I let the pet outside to kill my grass, which I don't care about when it's my dog's doing it, but when it's somebody else's dog ruining my grass, I get upset. I've been thinking about this a lot this week. You know, this boundary that we draw around what is and is not our responsibility. You know, cleaning up after somebody else's pet, someone else's child, you know, people leaving litter in a park or any other inconvenient thing we end up having to do. You know, they, we, we draw a line, we create a boundary. And I've been thinking, like, what creates that boundary of what's mine to worry about and what's not mine to worry about? I want to take, take this idea with us as we jump into our scripture lesson today. What does it mean to care to take care of other people's stuff? What does it mean to serve others? Where do we draw this line on what is and is not our responsibility? How does, how does Jesus expand or contract that line? What does it mean to create and maintain these boundaries? And how do we find out who built and drew all these lines in the first place? Our scripture lesson this morning is from Luke 16 verses 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man who clothed himself in purple and fine linen and who feasted luxuriously every day. At his gate lay a certain poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. Lazarus longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Instead, dogs would come and lick his swords. The poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried. While being tormented in the place of the dead, he looked up and saw Abraham at a distance with Lazarus at his side. He shouted, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, whereas Lazarus received terrible things. Now Lazarus is being comforted, and you are in great pain. Moreover, a great crevasse has been fixed between us and you. Those who wish to cross over from here to you cannot, neither can anyone cross from there to us. The rich man said, Then I beg you, father, send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers. He needs to warn them so that they don't come to this place of agony. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They must listen to them. 
The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will change their hearts and lives. Abraham said, If they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they have been, be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. For scripture in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to God. I love this story. You know, Jesus is not mincing words here with his audience. He's being very straightforward about what he's saying and who he's saying it to. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and just before he tells this story, he calls them friends of money. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, when a person is a friend of money, their beliefs about the socioeconomic order usually align with the ways that make them wealthy, meaning they are okay with exploiting poor people in order to gain or maintain status and wealth, or at the very least, wealth helps them justify their actions amongst themselves. And so... This is all in the backdrop of Luke 15, in which Jesus redraws the boundary of who is in and who is out in the kingdom of God. You know, at the beginning of chapter 15, the Pharisees are, are grumbling about Jesus eating with sinners. Then Jesus talks about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, after which he starts bringing up people's relationship with money. At this point, the Pharisees' grumbling has now evolved into ridicule. And Jesus responds by saying to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves before other people, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued by people is deeply offensive to God. And then he elaborates. And so Jesus tells the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man is depicted in excessive, even outrageous terms, while Lazarus is numbered among society's expendables, a man who had fallen prey to the ease with which, even in an advanced agrarian society, persons without secure land holdings might experience devastating downward mobility. Jesus highlights several things in this parable that are worth noting about both the rich man and Lazarus. The first is their clothing. The rich man is decked out in the finest clothes money can buy. White and purple linen. Purple was the color of opulence. It costs a lot of money to dye clothes purple. So a white garment underneath and a purple robe signified that a person was in the highest stratosphere of society. Meanwhile, Lazarus was clothed in sores that attracted dogs. The second thing to look at is what they're eating. The rich man has a feast every day. Every day he holds a banquet for people. And I kind of picture the table overflowing with food and people eating their fill and throwing the rest outside to the dogs or on the ground, making a real mess for somebody else that, to come and clean up. Meanwhile, Lazarus sees the scraps and the bones and the pieces of bread people are tossing out and, and wishes he could eat them. And the third thing to think about is their location where they live. The rich man has built himself a vast estate. He was able to build walls and gates outside of which we see Lazarus, literally outside his gate, on the other side of this boundary. You know, the identification of neighbor cannot be understated here. Lazarus is the rich man's neighbor so much so that he lives right outside his gate. This rich man cannot leave without running into Lazarus. Clothing, food, and housing pretty important factors of this story. Now, up until this point in the story, people would expect that the rich man is the moralistic one in this scene. The rich man must be holy and righteous since he's rich. God has blessed him, otherwise he wouldn't be rich. Meanwhile, Lazarus must have offended God by doing something, otherwise he wouldn't be suffering so badly. You know, there's big Job vibes in this parable. People are responsible for their own suffering because of their sinfulness. So Jesus paints this picture of someone who is doing great. The rich man has it all. And then there's the poor beggar who is, who is subhuman. And this is where Jesus flips the narrative. Remember, we've been flipping things these last few weeks and asking what else can we learn from these stories? You know, I got that idea from Jesus because he's always flipping stories on their head. And that's what he does when the rich man and Lazarus find themselves in Hades, you know, which is the Greek concept of the afterlife. So both of these people find themselves in Hades, except now their fortunes have been reversed. It is Lazarus who finds himself being cared for by Abraham, the father of their religion. Meanwhile, the rich man's experience 
of the afterlife is full of suffering. So we have a parallel story. Lazarus and the rich man are in the same location, but their experiences are vastly different. And instead of a gate, we have this vast chasm separating them, one that nobody can cross. And it's in this place, in the afterlife, that we see that the rich man's new circumstances have done little to change his heart. The scholar Joel Green writes, Amazingly, the wealthy man has not been humbled by his new and undoubtedly startling circumstances. Instead, he assumes that Abraham is still his father and that Lazarus, whom he knows by name but has never helped, is present with Abraham in order to carry out errands on behalf of a wealthy man like himself. Jesus is pointing out the deep hypocrisy that resides in the Pharisees who call Abraham father and their relationship to money and their relationship to the systems that have been created to make them rich at the expense of the poor. And it is the poor who Jesus is constantly inviting to the table. That's why they're mocking Jesus, because he's eating with sinners. And so the rich man asks for mercy. And when Abraham denies that, he asks for more mercy. He, he isn't getting it. The rich man isn't understanding what's going on. Joel Green continues, in his agony, the rich man asks for Lazarus to be sent as a witness to his living brothers. The idea of the dead returning to visit the living was common in the ancient world, with some literary expressions of this idea oriented toward the return of the dead for the purpose of revealing their own fate or the fate of others in the next world. Against this background, Jesus' story is remarkable for its narration of the refusal to allow such a return. Lazarus was not permitted to return, nor are the wealthy man's brothers granted any warning from beyond the grave for the fate waiting them. Abraham thus refuses to grant an apocalyptic revelation of the fate of the dead, insisting that the witness of Moses and the prophets should suffice. The wealthy man... Accustomed to extra considerations, will not take no for an answer. Continuing to speak from his supposed position of privilege, the wealthy man insists that for his family, more is needed. That a special envoy is required. This story, this parable, is about a man who was born into a world of privilege that was built for him, and he and others continued to create and maintain laws that benefited them and dehumanized the poor. They drew lines and boundaries because if poor people were dehumanized enough, all of the laws of Moses and the stories of the prophets about caring for your neighbor didn't matter because that person didn't count as a neighbor. Jesus flips the story because the rich man is not the righteous one, nor is he the one who inherits the promises God made to Abraham's children. And in this story, it all starts with, with clothes, food, and housing. Those three things really stuck out to me this week. Clothes, food, and housing. We don't know what happened to Lazarus that brought him into such a state of suffering, but what we do see is that his basic needs are not met. In 1943, a psychologist named Abraham Maslow wrote a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation. In his theory, Maslow identified needs that caused either deficiency or growth. That is, if you don't have some needs met, you are motivated as a human being to obtain them. This theory worked through the psychological world and became known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. It's used in education, healthcare, social work, sociology research, and higher education. It has five layers to it, and it's often depicted as a pyramid with a person's most basic needs at the bottom, of which physiological needs are first and foremost. We see food and shelter and clothing being an absolute basic necessity, along with air, water, and sleep. That's the bottom layer of this pyramid on which everything else rests. Food, clothes, water are absolutely necessary. On top of that first basic layer of the pyramid, the next set of needs are safety. We need personal security, we need bodily autonomy, we need employment and healthcare and resources to navigate the world. And from there, the next layer, we move into our psychological needs. So those bottom two are all about physical needs, 
And then the next two are about psychological. Above safety is our need for love and belonging. We need friendships, intimacy, community, a sense of connection or, or something greater than ourselves. And on top of the interpersonal relationships, you know, our relationships with other people, is our relationship with ourself. You know, our own esteem needs. We need respect, we need self-respect and self-esteem and status and freedom and a sense of worth and purpose that is inherent to our being. These first four layers, all of them are labeled as deficiency needs, meaning that if we don't have them, we struggle and fight to, maintain, to, to obtain them. And then at the very top of the pyramid, we have the growth need, self-actualization, the desire to become the most that one can be, to improve, to grow, to get better at something. It's only after all these other needs are met that we are able to strive to improve. This is where I want to flip the story this morning. I want to look at the rich man and Lazarus with this lens of understanding of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Jesus is talking about judgment for the Pharisees. We can see that and say, yes, this scripture is an indictment against the Pharisees that are mocking Jesus to bring liberation, about bringing Jesus' mission to bring liberation to the oppressed. But we can also turn that gem and see that Jesus is saying something about humanity's basic needs and how we are to act and live in a society that has set up rules and systems that dehumanize others so that we can justify not helping meet their basic human needs. Because that's what I see at the heart of Jesus' message. Someone who, who had all his needs met failed to recognize his neighbor and help lift, up, lift him up to this idea of self-actualization, of growth and thriving. Because Lazarus did not have food. He did not have clothing. He did not have security. He didn't have health or love or belonging or a sense of respect or self-esteem. Lazarus, too, had bought into this his subhuman state. He bought into the message that because he was suffering, he was not worthy of having his needs met. Jesus flipped that story. His depiction of the afterlife shows that God's heart and God's promises extend to those whose society has deemed expendable, those who are thrown out by society or are caught by God. My friends, those same systems that existed in Jesus' day that dehumanized others for profit still exist today. Our world is still built to deny the most basic needs of our most vulnerable populations. In some cases, the people who are experiencing the worst life has to offer is because they are targeted by these systems. <clears throat> you know, just this last week, uh, the federal government charged 48 people for stealing $250 million in COVID relief meant to feed children of low-income families facing a food shortage. When we understand how food impacts this hierarchy of needs, we realize that our society is failing to meet the needs of those who need the most help. Because when a child doesn't have adequate food, how can they possibly go to school and for focus on learning? Or when they don't have a home or a safe place to sleep, how can they possibly go to school and focus on learning? If a child is ostracized from their family, how could they possibly go to school and learn about fractions? That's the gap we see in our world. That is the gate built by the rich man to keep Lazarus out. That is the chasm which separates us. That is where our society draws the line of what is and what is not my, your, or our responsibility. When we don't recognize the unmet needs of those in our world, we drift apart. And we start to think people aren't our neighbors. And Jesus is here to remind us that all people are our neighbors. Everybody and everything is our neighbor. I remember last year when I read about the Texas power grid failing during an unprecedented ice storm. Do you remember that? In February of 2021, Texas had an ice storm that lasted five days. Almost 10 million people lost power. The damages to the infrastructure of Texas totaled over $196 billion. And over 290 people lost their lives because their most basic needs of food, water, and shelter were not met. In the midst of that, 
I remember reading articles about how the failing of Texas's power grid created such a supply disaster of natural gas that Minnesotans were expected to pay an extra $8 million, $800 million in natural gas prices. I distinctly remember thinking, why is their poor infrastructure my responsibility? I don't live in Texas. And just like that, I was able to draw a line between what was and was not my responsibility. And I was very quick to do it once other people's lives impacted my finances. Suddenly, Jesus' words are both convicting and an invitation to me. You are the ones who justify yourselves before other people, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued by people is deeply offensive to God. Jesus is inviting us to erase these lines that society has drawn into our worldview. Jesus is inviting us to recognize the humanity of those that our world dehumanizes. Jesus is inviting us to bridge the gap and meet the needs of those around us, especially right outside our doors. Because when we have all when we all have our needs met, we are able to thrive to grow and to create a better and more just world. May it be so. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship today. God send you, the Spirit fill you, Christ go with you and you with Christ, always and everywhere. Go in peace.